So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how I made the cornice, which essentially the bridge between the cornice and the sill is going to be those pilasters that I made in the last video. And if you've been following along, um, I mentioned that there was a mistake in the measurements for the sill. I told the customer about it and we agreed that it was okay if the sill overhang um, at a little bit of a different dimension. So I just scooted it forward in order to account for that. But when I connected this cornice to the pilasters is where that mistake came to a head. And that's kind of the title for this video because this was quite a big mistake. I don't take full responsibility for it, but in this sort of profession, it really was my fault. So the last part of this video is going to be showing you how I made that mistake. It was a mistake that compounded everything and I had to make multiple recuts. So it's an important lesson to learn in woodworking. Anyone who says they don't make mistakes is a liar, but it's really important to think outside the box and think of ways to fix stuff. Most stuff can be fixed without a complete rebuild, and that's really important because starting from scratch on this was just not gonna be an option uh, for myself for multiple reasons. So the cornice is going to be built just like the other parts of this build. It's going to be a torsion box. I'm following the dimensions of the plan. I cut the front and then I cut the back and the whole thing will have a five degree angle to it, which makes making the curved top, which I'll start next week, um, a little bit more difficult. So you can see I just roughed out my parts, it has a little bit of an overhang on the bottom um, for water dripping. So you can see I made a dado there so that bottom piece fits in place. And once I had all my rough parts, you could see I'm gonna put dados on everything so everything fits together. Uh, dado joints are much stronger than butt joints. It also will make it so I don't have to put any hardware in this. The only hardware in this piece so far holding this together is the hardware I have on the cleats, the alignment cleats that I've been making. Other than that, and a couple brads. So you can see I set that up and then I had to cut that down as well. Pretty simple stuff. I'm essentially just making a box, but it happens to have a pitch to it. So once I had the angle cut in the back, I could do the same thing for the front. Now this top overhangs all of the sides by um, quite a bit because there's going to be molding on the underside of this. So I had to account for an overhang as well as I had to account for the depth of the molding. So it was about an inch and a half overhang around the whole edge of this. But all I started by doing was cutting out those marks that I had marked when it was put together. Um, this is all mahogany, similar to as before. And you can see I'm just using the dado to cut the overhang in the front and then the dado for where it will meet my riser in the back. So just a series of simple cuts. And then I have one of those um, friction plates that help you slide things through the table saw, but I misplaced it. I found out that a scraper for drywall works just as well. So if anyone's in a bind in that situation and you have a drywall scraper um, with a pad on the bottom, it's, it's essentially the exact same tool. So you can see I had to add the angle to the back of this top so that everything fit flush. And that's basically what we're looking at. Same process, four pieces. This one was slightly different because of the angle, but essentially the exact same concept. That's what it looks like. I'm going to go through and put um, the overhang on the edge and then you'll see how I, I cut all of my grooves to turn this into a torsion box. So that's essentially the first overhang. You can see now I have this inner box and I'm going to go through and cut those as well so I could stick a piece on the edge. Whenever I was doing this, I was concerned about edge grain. So that's why I went through and made the edges really thin and put a bigger chunk in. Now, in order to cut these, these dados I've been making, my top is obviously wider than the rest of my pieces. So in order to be able to cut all these on the radial arm saw like I have been doing, I just put a three quarter inch shim on all of my pieces. It makes up the difference of that overhang and then I could do the exact same process. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because a lot of the comments I'm beginning on this video are people that have watched all the other videos. I don't wanna show the exact same process in, in full every time because it just gets very repetitive. Basically all I'm doing is I'm using a stop 
on my station over here and I'm just cutting a series of dados. These dados will be filled with uh, vertical pieces of plywood and that will create a torsion box that will hold all of these pieces together. So I have a stop and you can see I could cut one since it's equidistance to the edge and it's not super important the exact spacing of these. I kind of stuck with roughly four inches apart. I could set up my stop cut all of my pieces on, on the right hand side, flip them around and cut them on the left hand side, um, and not accounting for the center, if I had 14 slots, I only had to make uh, set up the stop seven times, if that makes sense, because I could flip it around. And that's what all of my grooves look like. Those arrows were just reference marks, making sure everything lines up and then you can see the top will go in place. Now the reason I spent all the time doing this is because making this out of solid lumber would have cost twice as much as it already costs and that was quite expensive. And the other reason is you can see while this is a really nice grade of lumber, it will have bows and cups of it, cups in it, all lumber will. Even plywood and MDF, which is considered dimensionally stable, will have bows and cups in it, especially the longer the span that it is. So the torsion box will help pull all those pieces together and keep them flat. So you can see I made a plywood plug for the edge and I just got that to fit and then I could transfer those marks onto mahogany and make the exact same cuts on uh, my miter saw. And those are my plugs. You can see I got rid of some of the edge grain when I did that process for the dados so that it's not as much exposed. And that's how everything fits together. So then I could use that plug again and cut my inner pieces of plywood. And then I just did a, a bunch of these, I forget how many were in each. I could cut the angles on the miter saw and then I have a stop on the radial arm saw. I could cut it back square, bring it back to the miter saw, cut the angle and cut it back square. And then I could get all of my pieces. Now I am not gluing this together yet because I have to put some mortises in the bottom and that will be easier to do when it's apart. So this is the decorative part of the bottom of the sill. I have a backer in place. I didn't permanently attach this yet. And I'm gonna be putting another um, reference block in here. And that is how I'm gonna attach the sill um, to, to uh, the top side of the sill. So this is the block I made. It's very similar to the reference blocks I made for the plaster. It's basically just a piece of plywood that fits into these slots that I pre-cut before I glued all of this together. If you're completely lost on this process, it's because that was a couple videos ago. Um, I've been trying to put this into a playlist if you want to go back and watch those and figure out where this uh, sill came from. Pretty simple process. I could just put it in place put the sill on top, you can see how everything fits. And then I can mark the underside of where that lines up. That's the underside. And then I could attach it with screws. Now these are plywood, because like I said, plywood's dimensionally stable. These fins get really thin, and I thought they might snap off with solid wood. Also, like I said, these are just references for assembling this in the shop. When this goes into place permanently, it's going to be permanently attached to the structure it's being uh, put against, and these won't as serve as much of a purpose. They're really just references. Now, at this point, I had installed that built-in that you've seen in the, in the video, so I set up a piece of lumber that I could attach all this to and work on it. It also made it so it was a little bit lower to the ground, so I didn't necessarily need to use a ladder um, as much to work on the top side of this. At this point, because I had the cornice made, I could start measuring and cutting the plasters. Um, what I decided to do was make this really simple jig out of half inch plywood. It's basically going to make it so I have three tenons at the top of this plaster and then I'll put three mortises on the underside of the cornice and that's how I'm going to attach this. So like I said, this was I just scrapped plywood I had around the shop. I'm using a flush cut bit that has a bearing on the top. The top side bearing will follow my plywood and cut out all of the excess. So that's how I decided to do this. It was a pretty simple process 
um, in order to get this done. You can see how that bearing is riding along my jig and removing the excess material. Of course, it happened to be where I cut this. It went right through one of my plywood uh, pieces in the center. So you'll see I'll have to take that out because it is in the way. The cornice has to go all the way down. But same thing on the sides. I could just rotate the, the router, um, pop out that plywood. And that's what that looks like. In order to remove the rest of this, all I did was flip the jig around so that those teeth were facing the other way. And I just used the router to remove the excess. I, my camera must have cut out while I was doing that, so I don't have footage of it. But that's basically what it looks like once everything's done and it's flush. And those are 3 8 inch little teeth um, on the top. So I put my pilasters back into place. I put a straight edge across the front. It's really hard when you're doing verticals like this that aren't set in place yet, making sure everything's plumb and square. I did the same thing for the top, and then I could take the bottom of my cornice off and mark where those three mortises are gonna be. You can see I have center marked, and then I worked my way out from center, so I knew that they would be aligned perfectly, because this is going in a niche in a window, so you do want it symmetrical. And then there will be a backer to this where that other tooth will be, so that's why that overhangs um, a little bit. And then all I did was I used a jigsaw to cut these out. These don't have to be pretty or perfect. Once again, they're just alignment. So once this is in place and everything is glued, um, this will be plenty, plenty sturdy. I just used a jigsaw to cut those out. So that's what those also look like. I obviously did the exact same thing on the other side. And then I can make sure that this uh, top side fit had to put it the right way. It cantilevers quite a bit at this point. And then I had a nice uh, snug fit. All my marks were lining up. Uh, my pilasters were plumb, so, so that was a good sign. And that's basically what that looks like. And then you could see it's lining up with the pilasters there and lines up as well at the top. So then at this point, everything was looking good. So I glued together the, t the cornice so that it would be one piece and I could permanently, not per permanently for the shop, uh, mount it in place. And then I could start working on the crown. So same process, you could see plenty of glue. All of these plywood pieces get glue. All of these dados get glue. Really amplifies the surface area for glue on this. Um, it pulls all of the pieces together once they're fit into their, their little nooks and, and makes takes the bow out of everything as well. So everything's nice and flat. It's going to be super strong and a solid box so water and whatnot can't get inside here. And then I could put the top on as well. I had tons of clamps on these. This was just the process of taking all that stuff off. And then you could see this the niche. Basically, there's a, quite a bit of the niche up here that won't have any decorative bits. So I'm making most of this as a spacer because you won't see it. But for this part here, what I decided to do was put a, a groove in the back side of the cornice. And then I'm just putting a piece of mahogany across the back here because you will see this from the underside. Um, this window is actually quite high up. The sill of the actual window comes up to just about my chest. So it, it's quite tall. So if you're looking up, you will see that, that piece of mahogany. So all I did was um, I was putting, I believe, a quarter inch groove in the back. So I just lowered this onto the piece. I had some tape there for reference, but if this is a little long or a little short, it's not that big of a deal. And that is what my groove looks like. So pretty simple stuff there. I can then take my piece of mahogany that I'm going to be putting in, in its place. I can mark where I have to cut um, the other sides of these in order to create a tongue. So I just sent it through the table saw. I still have the dado stack in there. can flip it around and then send it again. It creates that tongue. That tongue will slide into this piece. And now that's how I got my depth 
for this going into the niche. I had to cut out a little bit of this because like I said, those teeth that are on um, the plasters go into this as well. So I just put those against the plasters, made marks and cut those. So now this will be one solid unit um, up top. And then I could go put in the engage plasters and this is where I noticed that all of my problems um, compounded over the, this entire process and this was going to be where my issue was. Um, so these were pictures I was sending to the customer and that is the engaged plaster sits past the cornice. It's flush with the sill, but it sits past the cornice and that is going to be an issue. The back side of this piece has to be flush against the wall and I had a three quarter inch gap on the top. What I decided to do as a quick fix was just push the cornice forward. So all I did was I pushed it forward three quarters of an inch. I recut all of my marks and I thought that that would fix the problem um, as, as fast as possible. While I had this upside down, I had some grooves left over from cutting dados because I cut through dados on the bottom. And all I did was plug them with some mahogany and once it was sanded, you couldn't tell. And that worked. So now you can see that the whole backside's flush. It's on the same plane. But then the problem came, I was working on my moldings and the moldings were gonna overhang. You could see what I had done to make up for the, the mistake in the dimensions was I had just moved the sill forward so that the whole thing was in the same plane. So the sill was three quarters inch forward and I was gonna put a shim in the back because that was gonna be covered by the mosaic anyway and it wouldn't have mattered but this plaster is gonna get a half inch piece of molding. By the time I put that on there, my trim would be way too far forward. Um, it wouldn't even be close to being accurate and I assumed it was gonna mess up the arch. So what I had to do at this point was I just had to suck it up. This ledge was supposed to be six inches and it is. I just had to trim three quarters of an inch off of it and then um, the ledge would be uh, five and a quarter instead of six overhang. It's not gonna make a difference visually. It would solve all of my problems, but it wasn't a super quick fix. So if you're watching this video just to see the process going forward, the entire rest of this video is fixing my mistake. It was extremely ironic because I, when I originally cut this, I cut it when it was still in pieces because I said it would be easier to do that, and it is, but um, this is stuff you'll encounter, and especially on this build, because like I said, I'm not used to working off drawings. I didn't notice that discrepancy in the dimensions. So when I did, when I went to go put this together and I contacted the client, we just kind of decided to split the difference. I hadn't been thinking about how it would affect things later on in the build. So this was just going back and fixing the problem. So now that this niche that I'm, that's going in the back is the proper four and a half and the overhang's a little bit shorter, but it's not gonna matter. So all I did was cut three quarters of an inch off the side, but now I have this exposed back. So I put some tr uh, scrap pieces of plywood on there and I'm using the exact same bit I used for the, the top. That bearing's gonna ride along this plywood and I could create some rabbits on the back side of this and I could plug the back. So that, that was ba fixing the sill. The problem was then everything above this had to be fixed as well. So this wasn't too bad. It's definitely a time consuming fix, but I'm the type of person that as long as I could find a solution, while it might suck, I um, will be happy to have that solution. Like I said, rebuilding parts of this, it just, with my timeline and the expense, it just wasn't gonna happen. So finding a fix was, was, was what I needed and, and what worked. So there is that recess. This is the scrap piece I cut off. All I did was cut it down to size um, so I didn't have to recut anything and then I could just fill that void. So like I said, that was basically how I ended up fixing the sill. And then you'll see when I put this back into place, everything was out of alignment. So I could slide this back in. I had to move those because now the decorative part was too far back, but that was easy. I just moved my reference blocks there forward. Um, you could see now the sill lines up with my space from the back. It lines up with the edges. It lines up with the decorative sill. For the top, I could put my plasters back in place. 
same thing I had to move my reference block three quarters of an inch forward but because of my engaged plasters those were now too far back so what I decided to do was make a groove in the plasters and now these fit into that groove and those fit in place so now you can see that those fit in place I had my cornice my original mortises were in the right spot so I moved those back to the original spots you'll see I had the holes that I thought would fix it exposed the engaged plaster was a little too short so I had to add a piece on top and then I could glue that in place luckily this is getting crown up there so the engaged plaster that shim that I added and the the wrong mortise holes will all get covered with crown um, um, the crown installation I'm planning on making a separate video because I was gonna put it in this video but it will just make it way too long so I'll probably do what I did last week and just uh, release that video on Wednesday but now everything is fixed at this point um, going forward